Yeah, finding out what's going on in Afghanistan here on Finding Respect in the Chaos. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Cynthia Sinclair. She is the customary host of Finding Respect in the Chaos, so it's only appropriate that she be with us. She's also a regular contributor on America What Now and America Finding Its Way on Wednesdays and Thursdays here in ThinkTech. And, uh, you know, she had set up uh, a show for this hour, maybe later on today, with a woman named Heidi Kuhn, who is an expert in appearing on national television on a regular basis to discuss the events in Afghanistan. Uh, so Cynthia and I will use this hour, or this half hour, as a, as a kind of run-up um, to what we can expect, um, not only from Heidi Kuhn, but you know, from, from Afghanistan. Here we are, we're in the middle of it. I would say the middle of it. Uh, welcome to your show, Cynthia. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate you hosting my show for me. That's very nice. Well, I, well the reason I'm hosting is I want to, you know, get some information from you. And first, I want to, you know, talk about the scope of this. Uh, it seems, uh, and I read an article this morning I recommend to everybody by Heather Cox Richardson, and she and she writes a lot about national events and national politics. And she, uh, you know, took a stab at trying to figure out what's going on, about what Biden said yesterday, about where it fits in the context of all the criticism he's getting from the Republicans, especially. And it, it seems pretty clear from the article and from my observation, I'm interested in your observation, that the decision to pull out, whether by Trump uh, or, or Biden, is a correct decision. But the devil is in the detail. The devil is in how you do that. And it seems like there are a number of flaws by Trump, which Biden inherited, and by Biden, um, in terms of how you do this in a way that's not embarrassing or destructive or, you know, lose the American franchise to the world. And so I want to talk to you about that and ask you about that. Uh, let me go through some of the questions that have come to my mind after reading the uh, Heather Cox Richardson article. And and looking at all the news stream we are getting lately on all the channels and every single media you can think of because this somehow affects everything. Everything, but in other ways, nothing. Um, how relevant really is it? So the first question, Cynthia, from your observation and your reading and research and you know, your mm, thought process, is, is this the right thing? Is it the right thing to pull out of Afghanistan? Yes, I believe it is. I believe we've been there too long. I think it would have been um, maybe a little more successful of a retreat or a removal or a withdrawal had, had Trump not done the kind of um, arrangements and that, that agreement that he made with the Taliban beforehand. And I'm still trying to figure out what it is that we got from them. We gave them 5,000 prisoners and their head guy, Ghani, and yet, what did we get? A, a promise? A no, no, promise? no. And, and, we, and we excluded the uh, Afghan government in the process, um, which, which meant that they had you know, less effect uh, than they did before, which was not very great. And, you know, we also, um, you know, cut this very strange deal, which allowed the Taliban uh, to go and do their own diplomacy from city to, to town to village um, and, and cut deals where they could bribe local officials uh, and, and have the army surrender. I mean, they started doing this some time ago, and it was all about that deal with Trump, which was cockamamie. And Trump and Pompeo, in my view, lied about it. They lied about, you know, you ask what was in it for us? Well, nothing. Trump was just doing it for political purposes to try to look good. But in fact, it was uh, the emperor's new clothes. There was nothing there there. Anyway, so that's, that's my view. But let's talk about how flawed this decision, you know, the execution of this decision has been. <laughs> Would you agree that it has been flawed? And in what ways? I do agree that it has been flawed. And, and I'd like to actually insert a quote right now from former Defense Secretary Mark Esper, who, if you remember, was fired in 2020 around all of this stuff because he didn't quite go along with what Trump was trying to do. And this is uh, what he was uh, quoted as saying in a CNN politics uh, article. <clears throat> he said on Tuesday, 
that he was concerned that then President Donald Trump undermined the US 2020 agreement with the Taliban by pushing the US forces to leave Afghanistan without the Taliban meeting the conditions of the deal. The Trump administration's agreement for bringing peace to Afghanistan outlined a series of commitments from the US and the Taliban related to troop levels, counterterrorism, and inter-Afghan dialogue aimed at bringing about a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire. But as per told CNN, my concern was that President Trump, by continuing to want to withdraw American forces out of Afghanistan, undermined the agreement, which is why in the fall, when he was calling for a return of US troops by Christmas, I objected and formally wrote a letter. <clears throat> my concerns was, oh, sorry. I lost my place for a second, sorry. He wrote a letter and what it was is he was saying that we should not reduce the troops below 4,500. And Trump just didn't even, didn't even bother to consider it, continue to just draw down to 2,000. So we are thinking that this is happening really fast. But in reality, when you think about when Trump first took those out, those Trumps out, he completely left all those outlying places defenseless. And so it wasn't that it all happened in five seconds after Biden started to take everybody out completely. It started happening back then, right? Each, each post that lost soldiers defending it became um, you know, I, vulnerable to the Taliban coming in. So it wasn't like they came in in three days. They started months ago working their way in, like you say, bribing officials, doing all that. So by the time, you know, it came down to it, of course the Afghani soldiers are gonna say, forget it, I got a family at home. It's not gonna go anywhere anyway. It's not gonna do me any good to fight, right? Because they're being betrayed by some of the officials. And then once, um, you know, the, the, the uh, Afghan prime minister left, that was it. it there was no, support for them anymore. America was gone. The Afghan government was gone. You cannot hold it against them. And I had a hard time with listening to Biden in his speech um, say that it's on them because they wouldn't fight. You know, that's not really fair. And I know I've heard a lot of veterans coming on and saying that, you know, those guys, they lost 6,000 of their people during this time. Um, or more, sorry, more, I think. So we lost 6,000 people. They lost lots and lots of people. They were brave. They fought to, you know, to the bitter end. And the end, unfortunately, happened to be when America left. Not the bitter end of saving their country, but that bitter end. Without that, this is what I keep seeing. What Trump did to the Kurds, okay? It's kind of like the same thing that he set up the Afghanis to have happen to them. He gave, you know, the Turkey free reign to come on in. And now he has given to Taliban free reign to come on in. It's like this pattern that I see. Lots of people are making the pattern of Saigon and all this other stuff. And I think, let's just look at the pattern of Trump and see how, that affected this withdrawal. And I think that Biden was very good to not really point the finger at Trump, 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 you know, he took the blame on himself. When in reality, he knows that he was sort of pigeonholed as to what he could do because of what Trump had already done. And a lot of, you know, people are coming out and saying that also. And I think that's important to listen to. Yeah, Trump, Trump set all of this up and Trump didn't give a rip about Syria and he didn't give a rip about Afghanistan. He wasn't going to protect the people or the government or any of the institutions or structures there. Uh, he was just going to take the steps that made him look good. So that's my next point right there is that who benefits from Biden looking like he blew it? <laughs> who? Who benefits most from that? The Republicans, sure, but Trump, right? Well, let's go systematically though, Cynthia. 
Uh, so they say, they've been saying ever since Biden spoke yesterday, that this is a flawed execution. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, how much of it is on Trump and Biden? You've talked about Trump, but what about Biden? What about the army? What about the intelligence uh, services? Uh, and how, what kind of flaws um, did, we, mm, did we reveal, uh, did we suffer under uh, in dealing with this withdrawal? Well, bottom line is the intelligence agencies gave Biden that, the information that it was going to go fast that this, the fall was gonna happen quick. And he, he made a bad decision in my mind to, to go with this whole, well, we didn't wanna create a loss of confidence in the government. We didn't wanna create a panic and all this other stuff, which is just, I hate to say it, typical uh, democratic mamby-pamby kind of thinking because it's just not based really in reality. Because the reality is his, in, his intelligence agencies were telling him it was going to happen quick, get prepared. You know, there's veterans agencies that have been coming out and talking a lot about um, how they've been warning about it. They've been trying to, um, you know, send Biden, you know, letter after letter after letter, please meet with us. We know from boots on the ground, we know what's happening, and they didn't ever get back to them. I, I don't know, what, were they too busy trying to do the infrastructure package? I don't know. I'm not quite sure why he tried to do so many big things all at one time. I think he would have been better off to split all that up and try to do it a little slower. If he knew he was gonna leave Afghanistan at this point, then he shouldn't have been wasting all that time on um, the infrastructure. He should have been focused just laser focused on Afghanistan. Then when that's done, okay, now let's work on Afghanistan. You know, they like to talk about doing, we can handle more than one thing at a time. Well, yeah, but not when they're this devastatingly huge. At least that's my opinion. What about the military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who have all kinds of on the ground information, intelligence, maybe separate from the intelligence agencies. Uh, did they do a good job or was there approach flawed? I believe their approach was flawed in the sense of they didn't make a bigger stink about the deal Trump was making and the, the way he was pulling people out. And we don't know for sure that they didn't make a stink about it. Esper did. He got fired because of it, right? Um, in Trump setting things up this way, and we got to remember, he's all about seeing how much he likes the bad guys, right? He likes the dictators, he cozies up to all of them. That's kind of what the Taliban is. So it stands to reason that those are his people, right? Um, and so all of his talk about, you know, for peace and I don't believe any of that. I think it was just a smoke stream to make us not really see what was happening on the ground. Well, that's reminiscent of Vietnam, isn't it? Well, in it Vietnam, is. they didn't tell us how dire the situation was, uh, maybe because they didn't actually know how dire the situation was, or alternatively, because they, they whatever the truth was, they weren't going to tell us. And, you know, it's, I, I, I suggest, and I like your view of it, is that some similar process was happening here. Well, yes, like I said, you know, the intelligence agencies gave him this information, the, you know, the current time you know well, that suggests that the joint chiefs knew about it. well and the joint chiefs knew about it they but we got to remember that a lot of the military the head people in the military were put there by who <laughs> trump you know they're not biden's people they're trump's people okay but in a short stroke you know, what we have is you you announced to the world that we are leaving by a certain day by a certain day and, and you actually put a mark on the calendar. And then you pull out most of your troops, you know, leaving only a, a really a handful. Um, and you don't try to set up a post-departure plan, really, of any kind, either diplomatically or militarily or intelligence-wise. Um, you don't protect the airport, which is the only way to get our diplomatic corps out. 
and uh, of course the Afghan Afghan interpreters out, you know, um, and you don't protect the road uh, from Kabul where they all were congregating because they they couldn't be in the in the hinterland anymore. They'd been chased out of the hinterland, so everybody's in Kabul. There's a road from Kabul to the airport, um, and it wasn't protected. Uh, and the airport itself, you know, was was a wasteland. I mean, there was nothing there to protect it. Um, what kind of plan is that? Uh, can you blame Trump for that, or is that Biden, on Biden, or is that on the, on the uh, is that on the chiefs of staff? Well, I think it's not going to be like we can blame one person and say it's all their fault. I mean, just like I can't say it's all Trump's fault, or it's all Biden's fault, or the chiefs of staff, or the intelligence agencies. It's sort of got to be a combination thing, right? The bottom line is, and I like that, that you know, President Biden said that. Well, the buck stops with me. I'm not going to make excuses. He made a decision. And, you know, as it was, though, we got to think about this. When Trump arranged all of this, they were supposed to be all out of the country. All the troops were supposed to be out of the country by May 1st. That's only three months after Biden took office. Yeah. So he's scrambling around trying to just get an extension so he can put together some sort of plan. Because just like they had no plan on how to, you know, roll out the vaccines, they also had no plan. Or if they did, they didn't give it to Biden. Even though you see Secretary Pompeo standing up there right next to Ghani in the same, in the same picture with the guy. And that to me is sort of all of it. And I'm going to lose track of where I was there for a minute because I want to focus on this. Um, 5,000 prisoners. We worked for 20 years over there, working hard to route out the Taliban, arrest them, imprison them, get them out of the country and out of the way where they could no longer terrorize people. Right? 5,000 of them imprisoned, Trump let them all go. So now they're fighting against the Afghans. So now they're out running around town with their you know, AR-15s. And so that to me, and, and then let this Ghani guy out too, who is one of their leaders, who is now one of their main leaders going forward. How can that not fall on Trump's lap? So, you know, I, I don't. OK, well, recognizing the difficulties and the lack of a plan and the legacy that Trump left, the impossible legacy that Trump left for Biden, um, whether Biden wants to rely on that, you know, uh, complain about it or not. But here we are. OK, and we left and now we're putting 6000 troops back in. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that is kind of an admission of failure, isn't it? And by the way, I don't think the 6,000 troops are there yet for logistical issues about delivering them um, to Afghanistan and to the airport. But I heard that they were already stationed around um, in the area so that they would be easily brought back in if they needed to be. They mm -hmm. did sort of try to plan for that contingency. You know, where I was going for a minute with that was that May 3rd, that May, I mean, that May 1st deadline that Trump had set, when he got there, Biden extended it with some kind of agreement with the Taliban to August. That's how we got this extra three months as it was them in that ceasefire, right? I thought, I thought it was September 11th as an iconic date. I, well, I, was it not August 1st? It was August 31st, right? Yeah, the end, it ultimately wound up to be August 31st. But then I, I think what happened is that uh, Biden changed that to this past weekend. <clears throat> and they, and of course, the Taliban heard him say that. And yeah. they made their moves. You know, I, I, I always wonder, you know, back in the day of the first Gulf War, there was a CNN reporter by the name of Deborah Wong. I don't know if you remember her. Uh, she was a really good reporter, and she was there at their intelligence briefings. But they would exclude her from things like deadlines. They would exclude her from the military plans they were formulating. And so the, re the reports we were getting were, yeah, valuable and interesting, um, but they didn't have the detail. 
for, for reasons that are not clear to me, these days we seem to give the American people and the world, including our adversaries, the detail of our plan, which allows them to plan. It's like telling the guy on the other side of the chessboard what your next move is, uh, which is, you know, it's not a recipe to win. But let me let me ask you this, though. So now, soon enough, if not already today, which is Wednesday in Afghanistan, there will be 6,000 troops there. And presumably they'll be guarding the airport and the road and helping anyone left from the embassy to get, get out of the country. And hopefully uh, they'll, they'll be doing security at the airport so thousands of Afghanis won't be uh, grabbing on the landing gear of our, of our transport planes. <clears throat> but um, how long can they stay, Cynthia? Um, and um, what happens uh, at home when they stay maybe a, longer than people expected? When they, <clears throat> the diplomatic corps is gone and the only people left who we might care about are the interpreters, um, <clears throat> and they're still there, and the troops are still there. How long can that set of circumstances continue before we get additional criticism and possibly, you know, um, uh, you know another attack um, on them by um, a huge uh, Taliban force? Um, how much time do we have before we have to really cut and run? Not much. Not much time at all. And if you ask me, the minute we leave, we should bomb every single base that we well, left. Easy there, girl. Easy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think about the women and the children, and it just gets me so fired up that um, I want to do anything and everything that needs to be done to protect the women, the women who they knew what was coming, went out and bought burqas so they would be prepared. And if you look at the streets of Kabul, there's not a woman in sight till you get to the capital. And just today, there was a small contingency of women that were holding signs, we want our freedoms. Um, boy, it wouldn't be want okay. to be one of them. Oh boy, they're all dead. Well, I mean, you wonder about that because the Taliban are trying to, or at least it seems like to a certain degree, they're trying to be, uh, at least appear to be civilized. Um, they want to be, um, they want to have a place at, at the table in the family of nations, maybe, I don't know. Uh, they, it seems like the leadership is emerging to, to some extent. Um, and I think they, you know, they could have taken over the airport yesterday and they didn't. And they could be fighting with the, the troops, the American troops, who are there to evacuate people. And they, they really aren't, not yet, not that we know. Uh, and so it could be that they're holding back. And I guess the question that I put to you is how, how long will they hold back? Um, how long will the American mm, public opinion uh, allow uh, President Biden to leave the, our troops there? And how long will the Taliban hold back before they attack whoever is there? Any thoughts on that? Well, right now they have stated, and, and while we've been on this show right now, I, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that the Taliban were giving their first press conference today. Um, so I, I don't know what they've said, but I know a little bit of what I've heard, and that is that um, they have said they will not stop people from getting to the airport. If they have the paperwork, they have the proper paperwork, then they can go to, they will not stop them from going to the airport. So I now, know- what does that mean for an interpreter? They better have the right paperwork. That's what it means. It means they better have the right paperwork. Who's I know, issuing the paperwork? Um, well, the government, right? Does USAID and- and um, what is it, SID? And one? And well, we'll see what happens. It'll be a big question exactly who gets through that. But what, what's interesting from what you say is that, yeah, okay, who's going to be checking the paperwork, the Taliban? And if they say no, what are you going to do about it? Um, so, I, you know, really, the, the, the thing is now in, in play. It's in transition. Uh, they have to show uh, maybe the press conference is a good thing in terms of them responding to international interest on what they're doing. Um, I think if I were a woman or girl, I'd be terrified. If I were a former member of the government, I'd be terrified. And if I were an interpreter, I'd be terrified. 
And that's lots of people, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, which we may or may not be interested in bringing back. Um, and, that, and that goes to the, the last point in our discussion here. I know you wanted to talk about that. And I call this part of our discussion criticism and hypocrisy. Oh, yeah. um, we do have other issues in this country, and this all happens in the context of those issues and the, you know, the political dynamics that are playing out uh, um, following Trump. Um, what is happening and what are your thoughts about both the process, the issues, and of course, the hypocrisy, hypocrisy? Well, some of the process is that, you know, didn't Congress just approve a whole bunch of money, like a billion dollars or more, to go ahead and get these Afghani translators out of the country? Didn't they just get a bunch of money to do this? What happened to that? Where I mean, maybe they're using it now. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I'm but, not sure it was ever passed. Oh, okay. I thought it. I don't. I don't know. I'm not sure either. Um. I know that the hypocrisy of the Republicans is just making me a little sick to hear them just point all the fingers at Biden and not even for one minute try to put some of this responsibility on Trump where it belongs. Um, as a matter of fact, they are praising Trump. He made this great deal and then Biden screwed it all up. That's what they're saying. And, I, and that's in a nutshell, about four or five different interviews that I sort of um, I put down for my own in my own words, right? But at any rate, that's basically what they're saying. And it's that part has just really got me. So one of the things that I think is important to realize here, and one of the things that is maybe a motivator for the Taliban and why they're being so measured and reserved, and it would be because of the fact that when 20 years ago, when we got there to Afghanistan, it was a wasteland. There was nothing. Soviets had burned everything and wrecked everything. And then during the battles, they had put in all these landmines. So there was no farming anymore. There was nothing really. There was, everybody was in, it was the poorest of poor going on. Um, so now after 20 years, there's all these businesses, there's all this stuff. They've upgraded some of the, especially some of the housing in, in Kabul and some of the other outlying areas, the bigger um, places. So it used to be that their only main source of income was their heroin trade, right? Well, now they're going to be in charge of a country that actually has an economy now. And so they don't want to ruin that, right? They don't want to do something that's going to wreck that. And I know that we're almost out of time, so I'd like to just really quickly um, put a little preview of a show that's going to happen later on um, that was supposed to happen earlier today or, or right now during this show. Um, there's a woman named Heidi Kuhn, and this is her book called Breaking Ground. She has been removing landmines and replacing them with crops all around the world in about 30 different countries. Um, for the last 20 years. She's been in Afghanistan since 2001. She has turned it from a landmine ridden country to removing the landmines and replacing it with grapes, right? And coffee. And I can't remember some of the other um, pepper, I think peppers in Vietnam. Um, but at any rate, she has turned her small piece there into an, you know, it's agriculture is 80% of their economy. Right? She has turned it into, she's now overseeing a hundred million dollars worth of export for the, you know, the grapes and the, the dried fruits and things and the nuts that they're sending out everywhere. And when they couldn't get meetings or people to come into the country really still afraid to come into the country to trade she arranged for them to go to them and you know establish these trade partners and it has been a very successful nonprofit for her 
prophet for the Afghan people. And she has done tremendous work. And right now she is in the midst of trying to get 340 of her partners and employees out of Afghanistan right now. She has been just madly signing visa things for them to be able to come so that they will have the paperwork to get out. So I'm hoping she will be on with me today at five. If not, look for us tomorrow at nine, okay? And her name is Heidi Kuhn and her book is Breaking Ground. And I recommend it to everyone. You can get it on Amazon and you can go to her uh, website, which is rootsofpeace.org. And they are in dire need of donations at this time to try to make sure they can fund all of this um, evacuation. Mm, very interesting story. And I'm sure there are a thousand stories like that. And the net effect is that Roots of Peace in Afghanistan is probably over. So many other uh, improvements that were made while the U.S. was there are probably over. I, we can't forget that. We can say, well, we weren't so good at nation building and so forth. But we did, in a way, build a nation. We did, in a way, change things permanently in Afghanistan. And this, this is a all the more tragic because of what's happening now this week. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Really appreciate your thoughts and your, your ardor on the subject. We'll talk about it again. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for coming on and being the host of my show.